NTU World of Wisdom. Welcome to High Impact Thesis. In this podcast, we speak with researchers from various scientific fields to talk about the motivation, goal, and potential impact of their research. We also want to give you a sense of how a PhD is carried out with an emphasis on the pH, the philosophical aspects involved in pursuing a PhD. Welcome to the High Impact Thesis Podcast. Our guest today is Mr. Mohammad Rajab. Uh, Mohammad, you're very welcome to our podcast today. Thank you so much. Okay, so as we do on this podcast, we like to ask our guests, who are you? Okay, uh, as you mentioned, my name is Mohammed. People sometimes call me Rajab or Ragab. It's fine. Mm-hmm. So actually, I was born in a, you know in a small town in Egypt, uh, in a city called Aswan, the town called Sibaya. Okay. So yeah, it's a quite a village. So uh, I have been living this rural life for the first sixteen or twenty life, uh, twenty years of my life. Mm-hmm. Then I moved to you know the city where I started to doing my undergrad. So I did my undergrad in uh, engineering, mm-hmm. mainly electrical engineering, mm-hmm. and more specifically in electronics and communication engineering, mm-hmm. where I graduated, uh, you know, with the first with the first class honors. Mm-hmm. Then I started working in the same faculty as a teaching assistant mm-hmm. and also doing my master's degree in a bit different in medical image processing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. at this time I was trying to solve problems in you know imaging devices like magnetic resonance imaging devices to improve the resolution of the image of these devices by using some applied mathematics. Okay. Uh, yeah, I have stayed in my master's for about two years. In about 2017 I have finished my master's. Mm-hmm. And, and this uh, was still in Egypt? Is that yes, everything mm-hmm. was in Egypt. Right. Uh, and and. Till that time, I haven't been anywhere outside Egypt. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I guess it's good. It's a good place. To be yes. In <laughs> yeah. So uh, at that time, actually, I was searching for scholarships to go around. So I have uh, started applying for scholarships for PhD. Mm. So I applied for many scholarships actually at Belgium, Europe, uh, and at Canada, US, Singapore. Uh, yeah, I think by May. Yeah, by May 2018, I have got two accepted acceptance. Mm-hmm. One acceptance from Canada, mm-hmm. in Carleton University, and another acceptance from Singapore, mm-hmm. in TU University. And after some, you know, you know, uh, uh, hesitations, and finally decided to to come to NTU. Uh, fortunately, okay. so, <laughs> <laughs> that's good to hear. <laughs> yeah, so I started my PhD at the 2018 at that mm. time, actually. Yeah, mm-hmm. and uh, I am here and I'm doing the podcast with you. <laughs> nice. So, so you want to give us a sense of what you're doing, broadly speaking? What field are you in, and what are the uh, uh, high level? What are the problems that this field is trying to? Yeah, have? sure. Uh, starting from my background was mainly like electrical engineering and signal processing. So what I'm doing actually is application is more now in, you know, mechanical engineering and manufacturing. <laughs> so the problem actually is that, you know, we have, uh, we rely on wide range of machines in our daily life. You know, we have trains, we have aircrafts, we have cars, everything rely on rotating, rotating machines. Mm-hmm. But and Which every machine rely on what machine rotating rotating, rotating machines yeah okay like motors and generators mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and actually uh, every machine is going to fail until you do properly proper maintenance for it mm-hmm. so yeah this is the main problem I'm aiming to solve so it's maintenance so you can imagine for example for for some manufacturing industry to do maintenance you need to shut down like the manu- then, you know the factory for some time. Mm-hmm. And actually, one hour of shutdown can cost you around, you know, you know, sometimes all over the world, it can cost million of dollars, only one hour mm-hmm. of, of shutdown. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also safety issues, you know, sometimes some machine failed, for example, aircraft engines, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. it can fail at any time and, you know, it can cause catastrophic problems. Right. Yeah. So, uh, uh, because of this, uh, you know, people start to do some research in this maintenance mm. uh, problems. So some people actually, uh, this is the most common approach, was trying to just remove uh, remove the parts in like in a regular basis, whatever it's failed or not, just to be more, you know, uh, 
pre-cautious. So, right. so yeah. after every period of time, you just remove the pump. Even if it's still working, right. <laughs> which is costly, but they mm-hmm. have to do so because they, they cannot afford, you know, you know, the failing of the machine mm-hmm. because of safety issues and because of costs. Mm-hmm. So this approach is okay, but it's quite costly, actually, you know, as I mentioned. And actually, in, in manufacturing industry, cost is, is, you know, is matters a lot because it affects your the, the price of your product. Mm-hmm. And if you cannot compete against, you know, uh, other manufacturing uh, industries like uh, with, with their prices, then you cannot go on. So by, by reducing the maintenance cost, you can reduce the, product, the, the price of your product, then you can do well you know, in the market. Mm-hmm. So this is the main issue, actually. And, you know, a lot of people are working in maintenance. For example, I will tell you one example. I, I have attended this. So in aircraft engines, mm-hmm. uh, so when the aircraft is coming down, so usually around 20 to 50 engineers are waiting to do, like, inspection of the aircraft within one hour. Mm-hmm. So, and you have to do this very fast. You know, uh, because, you know, uh, during transit, for example, one to two hours, you need to do this inspection. So usually they require a large number of people for the whole aircraft because any problem with the aircraft, they cannot make it, you know, flight again. So this is quite costly. And, you know, for for each transit, you need, you know, a large number of engineers. Mm. So this is a big problem to to only rely on a human uh, basis uh, approach. Mm -hmm. So here it comes to searching for some tools to help them to, you know, facilitate this kind of maintenance. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, this is like the main problem. Okay, and, and are you, you you mentioned that you mentioned the modern rotating machines. Is yeah. that the specific area that you're Yes, working? exactly. So what I'm aiming to do is specifically addressing this big uh, problem in rotating machines. Mm. Uh, yeah, and generally, so what was the solution? People was aiming to rely on the history. So we know that, for example, something is repeating, aircrafts are, are failing in similar ways. You know, uh, machines are failing in similar ways. Then why we don't rely on the history? Okay, I know that this machine has gone through this process until it fell. If I know the history, then I can predict mm-hmm. the current machine when it will fail. Mm-hmm. And this is the approach we are aiming to pro- propose to them. Rather than first changing in a regular basis the parts or the, you know, the motors, I can predict when the machine will fail exactly, then I can change my, you know, my bar that's going to fail just before the fail. Mm. By this, I saved, you know, uh, downtime for the manufacturing and I saved cost because I use the machine until it's failing. Right, right. That's... That's yeah. a very, very good overview. I think I'm, I'm very, you know, I'm just reading about the industrial revolution to see that I think the motor or the idea of having something do muscle work for us, I think that's very, very, I guess that was the key to it, you know, what I mean? so it's really uh, an interesting field. Yes. Machines and turning energy from one form to mechanical power and trying to do it consistently enough over a long period of time. Yes. Um, it's nice. Okay, so uh, we're talking about machines, we're talking about history, we're talking about prediction. Where, How does that all combine to you? Yeah, okay, so as I mentioned, machines are already evolving in, in the recent years. And there are some concepts called Industry 4.0. So, you know, we have know that there are many industrial revolutions, but the last industrial revolution is actually about data. So all mm-hmm. smart manufacturing now are relying on these smart sensors to record everything happening inside the manufacturing, uh, you know, uh, part like a factory or e- even inside a car. So we have like smart sensors to do all of this. Mm-hmm. So the idea we we have like a very big data from all these sensors, and this sensors is is this, you know is saving what or giving us what the history of these machines. How, how it is going from this machine from health to failure. So we have lots of data, you know, then we need some tools to analyze this data and actually, you know, exploit this data to extract some useful information for us that help us to, to you know, to save money and even in decision making. So here it comes actually to what I'm aiming to do. <coughs> yeah, so the main idea actually is we, we are aiming to learn from this data. And when you come learning from data, this is like the definition of machine learning or AI. Mm. So this is like what I'm trying to do is to leverage AI, you know, to learn 
best from this data to improve the what we call now it's this concept of like using smart like manufacturing predictive maintenance in general so i'm using ai to improve the predictive maintenance by trying to improve the predictions because you know the old scenario was what before data people like you know smart people like mathematicians and physicians were trying to model mathematically the machine and based on this model they try to predict what will happen to the machine but you know previously the machine were quite simple but now the machines are very very complex so trying to you know model the physics of the machine itself it's, it's you know you know almost like very hard even for experts so that's an interesting thought so you think that we, we are changing or the, the models currently are changing to not focus on how the machine let's look at the machine as a entirely a black box they just exactly the way instead of looking at the physics that's the approach that is you think is the future yeah I, i'm not thinking it's a future I, i'm thinking this is like uh, how one way to to address this problem right. okay, okay i i want to know what will happen in the future for this machine i have mm-hmm. only two options either to try to model this find like a robust mathematical model for this machine this is quite hard what else i can do as you mentioned is that deal with this as a black box what is the input what is the out Mm-hmm. and try to see inside this history and try to see what will happen in the future based on some similar scenario. So I have many examples of a failed machine and I have the, the whole history from health to failure. Then I can rely on this history. Given a similar machine, I can predict when it will fail, for example. Mm-hmm. So this is like the, the key idea I'm aiming to do. So what, what, sort, of, what sort of data gives you this uh, prediction ability? Okay, that's a, that's a, you know a very good question. So uh, it's actually changed this kind of you can ask like the data re- rely on what kind of sensors are we using? Mm. So so the idea sensors are actually similar to human you know things. So you have eyes to see. So this is like can be cameras. You have ears to listen. Ears listen what vibrational signals. Mm-hmm. Here it comes to our application. So uh, in our application, actually, we mainly rely on vibrational signals. So we put a vibrational sensor in the machine. And fortunately, the vibrations of the machine itself, it change according to its health status. So if the machine is quite healthy, then the vibration will be quite normal. Mm-hmm. You know, if it's going to start to fail, the vibration will be somehow unstable, but it's increase, you know, the amplitude of this vibration, increase, 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 until some factor, it will fail. So based mm-hmm. on this, this is the most common way, like is uh, they rely, relying on vibrational signals. Mm. Uh, some very recently people started because you need also to, you know, uh, talk about the cost. So you need to install a vibrational sensors at each machine or each part of the machine, actually. Mm. Uh, but some people recently start to use some inherent methods, like, you know, this is quite technical, but, you know, like every machine like have a current to flow inside it. And as a basic task, you have to measure this uh, current flow. The, you measure like how the current is going inside this machine. You need to do this task in the operation. You mean embed conductors in the machine itself? No, I, I mean in the operation itself. Oh. You know, the oper- the, uh, all those electric motors, for example, work by going the current inside it. Oh. And you usually, you usually measure this current. This is done, you know, uh, usually done in the operation itself. Not for the sake of min- monitoring or for the sake of, of collecting data. Mm. This is done inherently. So people are thought, okay, rather than adding new sensors, why not using existing sensors in operation rather than paying additional cost for vibrational right. sensors? So this is a recent approach to use the current sensors existing inside the machines to predict or, or, or to try to monitor the machine. So this is like mm. uh, the, the key idea. So, so for you specifically, you're using uh, vibration. But yeah, mostly for my work, actually, I use vibrational signals coming from vibrational sensors. And this is because you're actually working mostly with rotation, rotating machines. Exactly. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, in terms of your work, so how how does your whole work process go, like from beginning okay. till getting the yeah, results? Yeah, this is a quite interesting question because at the very beginning, actually, when I started my PhD, you can see based on my background, this topic is completely different from what I was doing. You know, 
I was doing in my master's like medical imaging mm-hmm. and in my bachelor was, you know, electronics design. So this is quite different. So at the very beginning, actually, uh, I, I didn't have any uh, prior knowledge about AI and machine learning. So I started learning this from scratch when I arrived in TU. Mm-hmm. And also programming. Uh, currently, I'm in School of Computer Science and Engineering. Mm-hmm. So it's mainly computer science, but I'm not computer science. <laughs> so I have to learn some basic you know, tools that, you know, people in computer science learn in undergrad, undergraduate level. I have to learn them in my postgraduate mm-hmm. level. So this was quite frustrating for me as a first year, actually, because I need to learn a lot. And even in lectures, mm-hmm. you know, when professors talk about some basic things, mm-hmm. for all the students, it's basic. For me, it's advanced, mm-hmm. you know. So uh, this was quite frustrating. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I started, the, you know, uh, learning this uh, AI and uh, and uh, machine learning uh, at the very beginning of uh, of uh, of my so after I started then my my supervisor okay this is like the topic you aim to do deep learning for health monitoring of the machines okay this is only what I got then start do research so I started do research <laughs> so it was very frustrating at the very beginning so because I need to find a problem I need to find open problem that I will do my PhD on this problem. Mm-hmm. So, and you know, when I started, just do these keywords, deep learning. So I will talk about deep learning now for, for people who are not very technical. So deep learning for machine health monitoring, lots of people. And uh, honestly, in a daily basis, I used to do the search. I found the new papers in a daily basis. So then I asked us, how can I compete in mean, this? And every idea comes to my mind. I just do search on Google. I found the idea implemented and published. <laughs> so, okay, so wow. yeah, I, I asked myself why. So the idea actually, deep learning is something called advanced or more specific machine learning. And I, I asked myself why. Why deep learning are so many papers from so many different you know aspects. People are in human science doing deep learning. People are in mechanical engineering doing deep learning. Everyone is doing deep learning. So key idea actually in machine learning was not that easy for anyone to go in because first you need to have some domain expertise and you need to know exactly how it's working. But deep learning is somehow, as you mentioned, somehow a black box mm. that you put your data into and try to just modify the output. I want the output to be like this. And ask the machine to predict this exact output and train them and it works. Mm. And honestly, most of the people, no one asks for like proofs why this is has worked only people are showing okay our performance is extremely good and we are outperforming previous methods and you can publish no one asking for okay can you show me a proof why this has worked no one (laughs) because actually no one has a proof so this was very frustrating for me uh, to compete at this area Mm. so what i started to do actually i can even like suggest for anyone who's having similar problems who can think about this rather than thinking in innovating in the deep learning because this is quite hard, I started to thinking how realistic what people are doing in my application. For what people are, are doing in my application, actually, they have a cleaned version of the data that's publicly available, a very cleaned version. Uh, what do you mean when you say clean? Yeah, so data in, in, in real world is usually have some noise, you know, uh, some missing times where when you're recording because sensors are, are robust and not are not robust 100 percent of time mm-hmm. and also you know you, you don't know sometimes whether it's failed already or not exactly at that time so there are much of uncertainties but people what what they are doing i found in this in this community or in this machine health monitoring and claiming claiming that okay we are solving the problem there is publicly available data they know exactly type of failure and the failures are quite distinct from each other and it's very simple data mm. you know and you know no noise no nothing of real life so and then you start apply your deep learning method on it and your performance is good mm. and deep learning itself actually is not that easily work you need to tune it and actually imagine that you need to when you train your model and test your model you assume everything is constant. Mm. You know, the temperature, the air, the dynamics, mm. everything is constant. But this is somehow not realistic in a manufacturing environment. How can you like make sure that everything is the same temperature? 
even even your model, if you like train your model in a machine in Singapore and you want to test your model in, in Egypt, for example, it will fail. Even if the same type of machine. Mm-hmm. This is one. Second, people were uh, using this. Okay, I'm training my model in this exact type of machine at this exact part and test it on this exact part. You know, it's similar like I'm, I'm, uh, I'm giving, I'm going to give you exam, you know, but when I give you like something to study, I give you the exam also to study. So, <laughs> so you are, you are training on the exam and testing on the exam. Hmm. So people are not learning like somehow general models that can work in, in real industry, you know, hmm. because you, you, you assume some conditions that cannot happen by any way. So this is came to my mind. Okay. This is not realistic. That's why it came to invent a new problem, actually. Mm-hmm. So now I, I said, like, deep learning is not realistic. I need to make my deep learning more robust under new conditions. Then I did what? I trained my model under one condition mm-hmm. and tested my model under different condition. And what happened? Performance in the model was 100% or 99%. It dropped to 50 and 60%. Mm-hmm. Then I showed them that there is a problem you need to solve. I started to make deep learning now more robust that even if you, you know, you, you put it in any condition, it has to work well. Mm-hmm. So here it's starting actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, and every time I stuck or I, I found that, uh, and actually fortunately, when I think about a problem, I start like doing some research, no papers. Mm-hmm. So starting to, you know, introduce this problem and try to do some work. And by the time I, you know, fortunately, which is make me trust my, my, my thinking is that some researchers are starting to produce some single paper or two papers at the very, at this direction, making it more robust. Mm. So I started to trust my direction. Uh, and by this way, yeah, I'm, I'm going on by this way. So I believe the idea, many people can stuck with this problem when you are searching for BHD open area. Start if you uh, and actually at the very beginning my supervisor asked me whether I want to want to work on theoretical or apply. Mm. Theoretical computer science is much different. No application. You you just dive in math and lots. I told them I need to apply. For me, I prefer applied for two things. It's easier. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and but you feel that you you are solving real problem. So when you talk about your PhD, I'm solving like I'm trying to solve a real problem. You know uh, that anyone can understand. So this is how I actually started forward in, in, in my PhD. Oh, okay. Can you uh, briefly mention to the listeners who are interested in this area, what, what kind of tools you use on a daily basis in your research? Okay, yeah, tools actually. First, uh, it's mainly, we mainly rely on like codes. So codes mainly actually the most common programming language is Python. Mm. So actually, you know, Python now is becoming the most, you know, a popular programming language all over the world. Mm. So I think this is the most important tool you need to learn. This is one. Then actually you need to know, okay, I, I learned programming, then how can I do program? How can I, I, I write codes? So you need some editors. So for, for me, actually, when I, I started at the very beginning, I started with a very simple editor, you know, a visual editor, like easily can write and see visually. Uh, this is okay for, for people who are beginners. Some are very, very famous editor called Jupyter Notebook. Jupyter Notebook is like a, a web browser. So you, you write your code in a web browser. So you feel like it's, you know, it's not like the black screen of a programmers. You, you don't feel that this is quite hard for me. So mm-hmm. I started by this way. So I'm spent actually in the first year I was working on this, mm-hmm. but actually, uh, I, I have some habits. I usually search for what is the best. Okay, is Jupyter Notebook is the best? So I, I usually search for what the best tools for AI, for example. So I found that some editors are actually more easy for deployment, can detect where is, uh, you know, if you, if you wrote something in uh, or misspelled something, it can detect it for you. If you undefined something, it can detect for you. So I started using something called PyChart. Unfortunately, all these, usually Python and most of these things are free. This is a very important thing actually I found. Usually open sourcing in this computer science is a lot. In you, in tools you are using, programming language you are using, you know, everything mm. is open source. Yeah, uh, uh, another important tool actually uh, for my specific area, beside, uh, so you are doing the code, you, you are editing, you are editing your code in, in Jupyter Notebook or Bychar, is it's not at all actually it's like i source the computational resources mm. 
And here it comes to a big problem. So as I mentioned, we train models on data, big data. So our normal PC will not work usually very well. Sometimes you can, at the very beginning, I have like my normal PC. I, I used to run it for two weeks, you know, to, to get one result. So this is totally unpractical. And actually at the very end, it happens. So after two weeks, I discovered there was an error in the code. <laughs> you know, I need to repeat this two weeks again. So, so I started searching for computational resources. So actually, Fortunately, some, there are open clouds, like, you know, something called Google Collab. Yeah. This is quite free for anyone, mm. and you can, it's much better than your PC, for sure. Mm. Uh, so I started using this Google, Google Collab, actually, at the, at the first year. And I believe it's quite important too for anyone who, who, who want to run his machine, mm. uh, or his AI model. So I believe this, like, this is the most three uh, basic tools I have started to use. Actually. And yeah. NTU actually also provides GPUs for free for people at NTU who are listening. So yes. At least in, I'm not sure about your, <laughs> your school, but in Triple E, for example, I also use GPUs and they are, you know, they are. Yeah, yeah, we have. So uh, after I, I finished one year, let me like to do this. So at the very beginning, my supervisor, I was a bit away from my supervisors. So when I started to get in more, I started to show some interesting ideas in the research. Actually, my supervisor aimed to support me better. So there is, we have a super computer center in, in NTU. You know, it's called High Performance Computing Center. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's paid, you know, but uh, it's from NTU to NTU. So, <laughs> so if your supervisor having some projects, he can pay for you. It's not very expensive, but it's quite powerful. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, so you can have an account on it and start running your machine. So this is one way. And actually, Singapore has a national supercomputing center. It's mm-hmm. for free. Oh, really? For anyone. You oh. just need to make an account. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, and there are a lot of, uh, you know, parts. And if there are some projects like that specifically for AI, and even if your supervisor can apply for it to have a specific part of it for free, but you need to have, they need to know some information about what kind of a project you are doing and this kind of thing. But it's quite good actually. It's called NSCC, National mm. Supercomputing Center mm. of Singapore. And they even they're making some courses to teach you how to use it. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So actually, the a few ideas that you, you you brought up that I thought would be nice to explore. I guess not. I guess philosophically speaking. Uh, one idea is the idea of models, and the other idea I'd like to explore is the idea of open source, open source of knowledge. Uh, on the idea of uh, models, you, you know, I, I said that I asked whether the uh, one way to look at machines is as a black box. That is, you know, I don't know what the physics is, but when there was this event, I could sort of predict that it's about to break down. You don't know about the physics itself, right? And so I'm wondering whether, uh, at what degree do you... Would would you say it is now a physics model since just any model that we create as humans is it's sort of like it's like there is a territory and then we have a map right and all the models we create in science are like that they're a map they're not the real thing per se so do you think that because it's something encoded in equations it's less of a black box than what we're doing now that is in the past you had equations that make f because they make kind of equations and today you have this thing that is just nothing to do with the physical world, but it's still a model. Uh, do you think that the ethical domain is less of a black box than what you're doing in machine learning now? So you mean people are aiming to get away from this black box in somehow? Do, do you think it is necessary to think of it in those two terms? Like, you know, this one looks like there's nothing we can measure, I guess. Uh, so we need to look in between, you mean? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm wondering whether physics itself, whether the models we have in physics themselves, even though we can label, give names to the thing, the variables, does it make it less uh, of a black box? Yes, yes. Because it's like... It's t- this, is, this is a very good point, and actually you have, you know, enlightened now in a new direction coming, it's called physics-based machine learning. Okay. So people are starting to... Because, you know, machine learning model can even predict, mm-hmm. can always predict, but can predict something that's terrible. Mm-hmm. You know, as you are giving him data, he will not say no. You know, for example, if you are giving him a cat, he, he, and he doesn't know this, he will predict anything, but he will predict that thing. Mm-hmm. So you need something to guide this. So recently there are something called physics guided neural network. Okay. So the idea is I, ne- I need to regularize its predictions to align with the physics. 
Mm-hmm. So they have like two directions in parallel. So I know the physics. I have the input. And I know like this output has to be within this range. Mm-hmm. So this machine learning model has to follow this somehow. Okay, mm-hmm. you need to predict. But at the same time, you need to regularize your prediction or, or try to make your prediction quite, you know, making sense. Mm-hmm. By making sense, I put in range of predictions, for example, both based on the physical scenario. This is one way, but let me tell you some also some truth that uh, I have uh, during my PhD actually in, in the last year I have done some internships in the real industry. Yeah, this is something I was he- hoping to do. Okay, I was working in academia, everything I have, the data, I was doing very well, very advanced work and deep learning. Then I started, okay, why I'm not searching for real industry here? Then I applied for ST engineering aerospace. Mm-hmm. So uh, at this place, actually, they were doing what? They doing like maintenance for aircrafts, uh, either like, uh, you know, uh, civil aircrafts or air forces. Mm -hmm. Uh, So fortunately, by some connections, I have been able to apply and I've been, you know, convinced that presented my work and I tried to convince them that I can do this for you. Mm -hmm. So I have, you know, uh, got offered to to this system unit. And here is a shocking you know, uh, truth. So when I joined, uh, I found that, so now, now deep learning has started since 2011, started, I mean, started to emerge mm-hmm. since 2011. Mm-hmm. So it's around 10 years, right? So in, in this industry now, they are not using deep learning. Mm-hmm. So far, they don't trust deep learning. They do not trust. So yes. it, it's Interesting, and because it's a high risk, because you said it's aircraft maintenance. Yes, so the, the, the main problem the guy told me is actually, I don't know why it is working. Mm-hmm. So I don't know when it is filled. And I cannot trust something like this. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's like, I, you know, the reason I was asking that question is because I'm not sure that in the past we knew why it worked also. It's like, if you have, in physics, you have two charged particles, for example, right? We have an equation that says, for example, the, the product of the charges divided by the distance between them squared gives you the force, right? So that equation, does it mean you know what is happening? Is it not still a black box? You're just able to, I mean, giving it, I'm just wondering whether, why do you trust that more, right? Uh, uh, I, I, like, yeah, yeah, I see. It but could fail someday, we don't know. It. Someday it might just be, <laughs> you know, the force is much stronger or something like it. Yeah, exactly. But uh, but I'm talking about in this using like data analysis itself or mm-hmm. AI. So the idea is actually it's using very simple model. That's mm-hmm. quite clear. So l- let me tell you. So in AI, uh, I, I will tell you the difference between machine learning and deep learning. Mm-hmm. So in AI, uh, machine learning people usually were doing, assume I, I want to recognize you, for example. Mm. So I need to have a, a specific features that, that describe you. Mm. So someone will, will come behind and try to engineer some features that help me to distinguish, you know, me from you, mm. for example. Mm. Uh, or, or I won't distinguish cat from dog. So some engineer behind will try to, because you want to teach the computer to distinguish between cat and dog. Mm-hmm. So you need to create some features. Okay, the cat has this kind of features and the dog has this kind of features. So mm-hmm. if you saw these features, then it is a cat. If you saw these features, then it is a dog. But everything is manually hand-designed, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. This is machine learning. So I understand first the problem. So I understand that, okay, to distinguish cat from dog, I need to focus on this and this and this. Mm-hmm. This thing, you know? This is similar. In machines, they, they, they were some engineers for each machine, you know, for each machine, they do this. So they try to design features that distinguish failure from health. Okay. Mm-hmm. I designed, for example, it will be a bit technical. You know, the signal, I have a signal. So the power of the signal, the frequency of the signal. Okay. When the frequency of the signal becomes with this range, it's most likely will fail. And when it is, it is with this range, okay, it will be working good. So it, I'm still using some machine learning basic model just to distinguish, but I know the main features that help me to identify, okay, mm-hmm. whether it's failing or not as an engineer. So I, I'm, for, I'm, re- I'm reading some sensor readings so I can identify. But what's deep learning doing? He extracts these features for you. Mm-hmm. You just feed the data and ask him to predict mm-hmm. automatically. So you feed him raw data, not a feature. Mm-hmm. And even now people are starting to explore you know, the learned features by deep learning to identify how he can learn this. 
Okay. <laughs> so uh, it was a for your information, it was a big dilemma for about five years or four years to identify dog from cat mm-hmm. because there was no because this is four legs and this is four legs. You know, mm-hmm. uh, they are almost similar. It was a, a you know a dilemma in this machine learning, mm-hmm. and then comes deep learning. It could identify very well. Then they started to go deep in this. Why? How? How could you? What kind of features that deep learning use to distinguish? Mm-hmm. And now it's it starts. Yeah, I, I, just yourself. for clarification, what is the main difference between machine learning and deep learning? The machine learning is that you need an engineer to design the features itself. So the features are ready. You just need a basic distinguisher or a classifier based on the specs. Assume like okay, I have like frequency value of one point four and the amplitude value of two. Then it's filling. If I have a frequency value of two and uh, amplitude of five, mm-hmm. then it is healthy. I just need something to distinguish number from each other. So this is a simple classifier. But deep learning, no, you don't design the features. I feed him the raw data directly, and he uh, he automatically. But fundamentally, they're both layers of neural networks. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, the fundamental mm-hmm. difference is actually uh, deep learning are multiple layers, and machine learning are one or two layers. So now they are reaching to 100 layers. This is the main difference. Mm. Is that, okay. Yeah, they just inclu- in- increase the complexity by including a, a lot of layers. And each layer is passing its output to the next layer. That's why it's complex to understand also. Imagine you are doing like some function. If it was one layer, I know the function. But if you are, you're repeating this, like every layer is learning its own function. And you apply the output from this function to the next until 100 layers. So, you know, the out, the input and output has been much different. Mm. You can do a lot of mapping. <laughs> okay. Um, and, and I want to explore a little bit about, you know, one of the really, I mean, I'm not a computer scientist, yes. say, but I use computers quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, but one thing that I find very fascinating about the computing industry or field is this idea of open source. Um, because I, I think... It's like you want to implement something, there is someone online with the solution, right? And I feel that this idea hasn't perhaps been um, applied in other fields. I'm just wondering, in your own, in your own I guess, line of work or life, yes. um, do you think it reduces, the, how do you control uh, intellectual property or how do you assign um, you know, rewards to people since everything is online? Um, is there something that is happening in the computing industry to, is it a problem? Is it not? Yes, it's yes, yes. You, you, have, uh, bit, you know, yeah. you have highlighted uh, a very big problem, mm-hmm. especially for me as uh, someone coming from electrical engineering mm-hmm. and uh, in electrical, we, we don't have this kind of culture, like open sourcing everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, although, although, you know, the, you can see like the advance ha- is happening so fast in this computing. But one of the reasons of this advance is the open sourcing. People are relying on each other, you know. But what is the main problem, actually, I found from this open sourcing is that, yeah, first, as you mentioned, everything, you can search for it. And you can find existing open codes for you to, to use it. And you can directly use it. You know, for example, I, I want to use a machine learning model on my application. But there are some machine learning have been used for image application. I can just download the model. It changes the input. I modify a bit, I run my model, and it works perfectly. And uh, I can claim, okay, I have done a solution for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so this is somehow, uh, you know, okay, it's fine, you solve the problem, but the problem in research, this is a big problem, actually. O- open sourcing everything, you know, uh, even, you know, in publications. So, you know, archive. Mm-hmm. So... That is spelled as? A-R-X-I-V. Oh, right. Mm. So th- this is a website by Cornell. Cornell University. Yeah, so it's like, you know, uh, non-reviewed publishing. So you can just publish your work. Mm-hmm. So actually computer science are relying on this. So why? Because, you know, the, in academia or research, as all of you know, is that you can submit to a journal, wait for four months for reviews to come, then another two months. So you can, you know, you, know, you can wait for one year for an album. But within this one year, in, in computer science, lots of technologies change. Actually, our understanding, you know, two years ago, people were agreeing on something. Mm. Now, they think that this, wrong, this thing was wrong. Although there were many publications claiming this, but mm. they discovered this was not right. Mm. So in computer science, everyone is publishing an archive because he wants to be... The competition is very hard. Mm. 
Imagine, I, I know some people that, uh, you know, people are publishing in advance of you because they are a fast coders, more fast in coding. This is the competition that if you are even slow in coding, <laughs> you could lose your idea. Mm-hmm. So that's why people are not aiming to work in computer science, are not totally working for this kind of journal. So everyone have an idea, write the code, show the results, put it in archive. Mm-hmm. Then, while it's in archive, then try start to target any conference. But now your idea is saved. Mm-hmm. But for me, this is a big problem. Why? Because this archive is still not publishing. So if anyone have used this, this is a problem. Second, is actually people are claiming that this is double blinded or in the revision, but the paper in archive for three months, and he just takes this paper and submit it to a conference, mm. and it's double blinded. But I know the archive paper and the same work. Mm. So, and this is actually, I, I have suffered from this a lot as someone who is not from computer science. Even my supervisor was more in the application, mm. not in the AI science. So I've seen some work has been like some bias. It's happened that I know the author of this is one of the pioneers in AI. Then for sure he is not wrong. Mm. So this somehow open sourcing, although it's quite good to improve the research or, or some people relying on each other, mm. but I believe it's becoming very, very frustrating. I see. I, I actually thought another angle to look at it is that in your field, for example, when you have built a model and this model is given to somebody and this model causes a plane to crash, because I guess that, yes. that's something. Or what, what, whatever, it causes an accident. In other words, the negative aspect of it. Do we point to the guy who initiated, the guy who got the code from, or do I assume responsibility? Uh, is it, yes, you know, is, is, is it my thing? How far is it my thing? And how far can I point, how far back can I point to the authors? Because there is still quite a bit that we don't know when you're looking at getting code offline. You don't look through every line, right? You look through enough to understand and to implement, and you wonder how responsible. Um, you are yes, yes yes but overall i think it's a, i i mean i, I like the uh, computer industry is probably the one that has advanced the most you know like the car engine hasn't changed much in 120 or 150 years but the computer industry is really was really really changed right and i think an example that i'm looking at right now is not directly computers but in in terms of uh, memory and storage you know in 1957 it was four hundred and eleven million dollars per megabyte, right? And uh now it is down to zero point zero 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 three. And I think that to some degree it's this idea that a lot of people working on problems, I think even if they're not super smart, but just the volume of people working on things, I feel that that is probably one thing that has contributed. So I I'm a fan of this kind of just lots of people tinkering and open source and hopefully we can find a way to make sure people are rewarded. Uh, correctly. Yes, yes. Okay, so maybe continuing on the on that same trajectory, um, talking about you know the past and then the future. Um, there's one thing that that I always notice with the with the machine learning and and deep learning, uh, you know, implementations that we are always having ninety something, eighty something percent accuracy. No one, no one is is able to get one hundred, and those who do are always like, you know, uh, uh, questionable, right? Like uh, it's just you, you always um, uh, undermine the results. Like, how can you get one hundred percent? But isn't that the goal? Isn't isn't what we're looking for is like hundred percent accuracy, so that like that uh, engineer from from ST Engineering can just take your model and use it immediately. So what what's 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 happening here? Okay, yeah. you, you have pointed you know a very good point actually is that how we evaluate the machine learning models or AI models. Mm. So if you are th- you know uh, in academia actually this is a, a a very like for for normal people who are outside this you know this uh, field we are thinking like that we we are really solving real problems. But but for your information actually we evaluate machine learning models in a benchmark datasets. People are like collecting datasets. I will, I will tell you exactly what's happening. For example, now in visual applications, the key dataset called ImageNet dataset, this data has been collected by some scientists in Stanford. He, she has spent four years in collecting and labeling this data, labeling that, okay, this is a cat, I add a label of a cat, four years. It has about one million image. So, but, you know, the key idea, all this is a benchmark, means that mm. everyone who is doing a new model and want to test whether my model is better or not, he, I test on this data. 
But this data is what is actually the image of, you know, cats, everything. But, you know, it's putting everyone in the center and cut it. And every, every image has the same size, has the same picture. And, you know, it's somehow like artificial. It's mm. not real. And someone, okay, publish a paper, I have achieved 91%. Okay, I have achieved 91.5%. Okay, I have, a, you know. And when they test the, their models, they have like a testing data part that I haven't seen before and test my model on it. But as I mentioned to you, is that you have pointed a very good point, is that why like not academia or, or industry use this kind of models directly. But these models will not work. Mm. You know, this is like, we call this like overfitting the problem is that your model is specifically designed for this exact data. And if you tested the model on a different data, it will fail directly. And so do you think the... the, the so uh, what, what I mean is that mm. this 100%, even if it has been achieved for someone in the field, it's not a big deal for someone understanding what is the issue. Mm. Because as you might achieve 100% on this artificial data, then what is the point? Uh, and this is actually something that, for me, in the next future, I'm aiming to move from this field. Mm. Because it's very frustrating that people are just competing for publishing. Right. It's not It's not for solving a problem. You know, I just want to improve the performance by, you know, 0.1% and I would perform this previous message to publish. But have the, okay, is this data is okay? Can I apply this in real world? <laughs> Same issues I addressed for my application is actually still existing in in other mm. applications. <laughs> and another thing you need to know actually, who, who are you competing against as a, you know, as a poor PhD student? <laughs> who are the leaders? Actually, you know, scientists from Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook are, are competing against you for publications. Mm. Imagine like with different computational resources, with different, you know, uh, uh, availabilities of scientists and, you know, they have a group of scientists, best scientists around the world they pay for them to come. But what's what's the incentive for them to publish? Why don't they keep the results in-house? Yeah, this, this is a good point. But for, for, you need to know, actually, for example, Facebook are using AI algorithms. The AI algorithms that Facebook are using in its Facebook are not publicly available. Mm. What they are publishing actually are very simple. So, in other words, what you see mm. now is actually they have done it about three to four years ago. Okay. Mm. <laughs> That's an interesting you know, So they moved to something. Yeah, yeah. I remember when I joined, when I, I joined in August, so I started to see how the Facebook AI can identify faces when you apply, upload an image. Okay, this is your friend, you know. Yes. At this time, I was reading the research of image and the research at this point was not able to identify with this accuracy. Then it was then how come Facebook are doing this? Then I asked some people who are working on Facebook, you know, someone was giving a talk. Then he told me, actually, we don't publicly available our algorithms at all. What mm -hmm. you see is actually, we're just publishing a part that has, we has done like three to four years ago. And although they have done this three to four years ago, they're still doing better than academics. <laughs> were. You know, so they are actually, you know, Quite in the yeah. future. So after the, you know, the algorithm become quite old, they make it publicly available. But if you see anyone working in Facebook, you see only buttons. I, see. Only I buttons. guess that does help uh, solve this idea of rewarding people correctly, actually. So you can still open source knowledge, uh, but you open source it at the right moment when you have somewhat benefit. I guess mm. the patent industry is about that as well, right? You make your knowledge available, but you first benefit from it. Yes. That's yes. interesting. Right. Yeah. So I guess what I was getting at initially is that do you think this this paradigm of machine learning and neural networks is going to stay for a long time? Or do you think there will be like a, a shift in how we deal with models and prediction and like something okay. better? Like yeah, yeah. I think if we are talking as like the, the next 10 years, for example, with all this like of funds that has been paid for AI and machine learning, I think it has to stay for economic reasons, mm. even if it's not the best. However, like pioneers of this AI, as you mentioned, they are quite well-known pioneers. You know, like someone called Jan Lee Kuhn in Facebook mm. and Geoffrey Hinton in Google, you know, uh, and Yushia Benjiu. Uh, he is actually working with Amazon. <laughs> so <laughs> you'll see that the pioneers have been <laughs> acquired. <joined> this. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> so we're talking to each other about what's next, actually. Yeah, what's next is the problem is that um, 
now to to teach uh, uh, AI model like to identify it, like cat from dog, you need to give one thousand example of cat and one thousand example of dog and train it with one thousand example at least, for example, or five hundred example. Mm-hmm. But this is compared to human is nothing, right? You know, so in human you can from the very first aspect you can identify everything. You know, you don't need to learn. This is one thing. Another, a, a very frustrating thing for current AI models is a task. I train my model to identify cat and dog. He, so it's only one task at a time. Okay, I will train the, uh, after it's learned this task and I train it to identify humans. It will forget the previous task. <laughs> okay, this is one research direction is going about, you know, preventing models from for, mm. forgetting. But so far, it's very limited to very specific tasks. So what people actually are, are thinking for the future is that self-based learning AI can AI model you know, just let him, you know, try by himself and learn by himself without, you know, mm. like search through the internet automatically right. and learn. Right. And this is actually started to, mm. to, to, people started to, to, to address this in this research. But I, I believe in the, in the next 10 years, it's, it will stay not because of it, it is the best option, but I think it, it's become like all over the world, everyone is being fans if you are doing any AI. And Michelle does you know. So I think it, it will sustain for this ten years. And what about the problem of, of uh, heavy, uh, like, uh, resource-intensive uh, tasks? Like, uh, you think about the human brain, right? It has billions of neurons, but it, it uses very low amount of energy to, I mean, compared with the machines. Do you think this is something achievable in the future, that we have very small devices with millions of neurons? Okay, I see. Uh, this is actually another controversial issue because, you know, in, in AIs, people are like motivating for AI by saying, okay, AI is quite green, you know, we need to be smart, we need to stop everything. But if you just do a search about how many electricity are done for training AI models, mm. oh, it's it's too much, <laughs> you know? So so I believe so far, actually, this technology is... is you can you are talking more maybe more related to electronics people who are trying to small, but literally there are research now is doing it well because everyone know we have general purpose processors then we have GPUs, now actually people are doing like deep learning based architectures for for deep learning, so I, I so there is something called TBU, Tensor mm-hmm. Processing Unit designed by Google. This is specifically designed chips for training AI models, mm-hmm. you know. So people are moving towards this, it's trying to optimize the design of the hardware to align with AI. I see. Yeah, but towards uh, you know reducing the power efficiency, this is actually yeah one research direction. It's to reduce like the amount of power that the hardware need to to. Do. But we are still too far from compared to human mm-hmm. brain actually too far. With this very low energy, you know, you can have billions of computations at the same time. Yeah. Makes you wonder. <laughs> yeah. The elephant has 257 billion neurons. Elephant. Is you want to guess <laughs> the estimate for humans? <laughs> the estimate for humans is 86 billion. I say for some time, apparently, people believe the more neurons you have, the more, I guess, sophisticated you are. So yes. the elephant. is... <laughs> 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 Uh, another thing I actually I usually disagree when people talk about neural networks he usually start okay inspired by human neurons we have found this and we have found that this can work and, huh. but this is quite misleading actually because I have been listening to because now some research neuroscientists are doing research to understand the brain so I was listening to a neuroscientist who was talking about he was telling that people who are saying that somehow neural network are related to how human you know human neurons are working, this is totally misleading. They are totally different. Mm. What they are doing, okay, someone has done this and it works quite fine. But so far, we don't understand how right. human brain is working already. So right. anyone who is claiming, okay, we are emulating human uh, <laughs> uh, brain, this is, he, he just wants to sell his product, okay, you know, something <laughs> like this. But I assume I, I, what we have is a very, very simplified version of what do we understand how the brain works is Definitely not representing anything. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I guess it's like what they say, it's 
it's like tortoise all the way, tortoise is all the way down, but in this case, it's models all the way down. Because when someone says it's like the human brain, they're actually saying it's like the our model of yes. the human brain yes. at that particular time. Exactly. And so I think it's 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 okay. Let them say that because impl- implication is that <laughs> it's about what we understand now, yeah. and it makes us feel good, like we're trying. But I, I think this would be the direction. Any discovery will happen in how brains work may give them some ideas about how to teach these computers to, mm. you know. That's why there is a, you know, intensive research in this, you know, usually open position for neuroscientists with AI, so the yes. collaborations. Mm. Okay. Um, I think a final round is going to be about you as a human being. Tell us a bit about what you do when you're not building models. Okay. Yeah, some, so, something about myself first. Uh, for me, I am the father of a very nice little girl. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> so, what I'm hoping to do away from this is to playing with my kid, actually. <laughs> Sorry? Is to playing with, with my kid. Oh, I see. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, so away from, you mean, research and this life, mm-hmm. which is actually occupying us <laughs> at some way. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to have some uh, some activities like playing football. Mm-hmm. You know, hanging out with us, trying to just forget about, you know, <laughs> this thing. Right. And I, I believe as a PhD student, you know, I have actually found some, uh, a Singapore guy, I was buying something from him. So he asked me, what are you doing? I told him, I, I'm a PhD student. Then he told me, okay, permanent head damage. <laughs> <laughs> And actually, this is truly describing us. <laughs> this is the thing <laughs> that I don't like about uh, this kind of... You know, you have a task. Usually people like, okay, I have like some goal. I need to finish this task. Okay, this task can take one week. Uh, at maximum two weeks, one month. Imagine a four-year task. <laughs> That's not ending. <laughs> you know, you go to sleep, you wake up. Okay, you still have a PhD every day. So trying to overcome this... Uh, even at the very beginning, you know, when I started my PhD, okay, I still had the f- first year, the first month, I still have about, you know, three and 11 months, three years and 11 months. This was not easy for me. Mm-hmm. So I believe one way to overcome this is actually I started to, in weekends at least, try to shut down my brain as much as I can, mm-hmm. uh, go out to do anything, but, you know, be away from any computers. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this was w- what I was trying to do actually, and yeah, I, or, or or being with my family, this mm-hmm. has helped me a lot actually. Mm. Okay, all right. all right. So that brings us to the end of today's episode of the the High Impact Thesis Podcast, and our guest today was Muhammad Rajab. So thank you, Muhammad, for talking to us about uh, artificial intelligence, about machine learning, specifically about how it's applied in the maintenance field. Thank you very Thank much. You so Thank much you so much for this uh, awesome talk. Thank you for having me here. Okay. All right. Goodbye, everyone.